thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, this is a day that we've been looking forward to, my family and I, for uh, several weeks at least, uh, since the months that we found out that we would be coming here. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's come so quickly. In other ways, it seems like it's been a long time that we've been looking forward to this. But nonetheless, we are so grateful to be here. And already, your love has poured out to us. I've realized one thing right away. I will not starve while I am here. <laughs> All we've been doing is eating food that's been brought to us and uh, going out to eat. And today, they're going to feed us again. And... So I don't believe that we'll starve while we are here. We are so glad to be here. And we thank you so much for your prayers. Several of you have sent notes of encouragement telling us that you're praying for us as we make this transition. And I can't tell you how much that means to us. It really, truly does. It's also good to be here amongst a bunch of Hoosiers uh, that are in this congregation and I know just at least a small group of people will understand me today because they speak my same language. And uh, it's good to be here. Just thankful to be here. I asked Mindy if I should start out with a joke. She said no, so I won't do that. <laughs> but let me start off with an illustration, if I may. Mozart, who most of us know, are familiar with at least some of his music, and if you're not, go home and Google him today, and you'll find out some, something about him, that he was one of the most famous composers uh, that's ever lived. But you may not know that his father, during his time, was also a world-renowned composer. And as a matter of fact, during his day, he was even more popular than his son, and his name was Leopold. His father was very much a perfectionist. And every night before he went to bed, Mozart would be made to play the scales on the piano or whatever instrument that he was using at that time. And sometimes when he wasn't happy with his dad, he would play the scales. But at the last one, right before he went to bed, he would stop short of finishing the scale because he knew this about his dad. Wherever his father was in the house, he could not stand that it was not finished so he would run from wherever he was and Mozart would start the scale and then run up to his bed and then he would just listen because he knew. His dad knew the scales and he would have to come to that instrument and finish the scales. Now, keep that in mind. We'll come back to that at the very end. But if I had a father like that, knowing myself, I would be doing the same type of thing that Mozart did uh, to his father. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about that at the very end. And now I want you to be looking with me to the book of Exodus. I want to talk this morning about a preacher, about a congregation, and how that both of them were very important to what took place, but they were not the most important. And that's what we'll see today. Exodus chapter 3, we'll talk about this man, this preacher, Named Moses, someone with whom we are very familiar in Exodus chapter 3. Moses, who had been a shepherd at this time, he was called to go and speak God's word to Pharaoh. If you're there in Exodus chapter 3, look with me at verses 9 and 10. Exodus chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 where it says, Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppressions with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now think about that call to go and speak God's word to the most powerful king on all of the earth. Moses, this is what I need you to do. Here is a huge responsibility given to Moses. It's no wonder that he's scared to death, nervous at least, scared to death at the worst. He realizes how important this time in history will be for him and his people. And then, of course, we know what he begins to do, what a lot of us might do in his situation as well. He begins to make these type of excuses they've been called, but I believe they weren't so much excuses as they were real fear in his heart. And so he begins there with verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Well, I know who I am. See, that's the thing about Moses. 
He knows himself better than anybody else does except one person. And so to this one person who knows him better, Moses is thinking, you know, I'm a shepherd. I'm a former murderer. I am one who ran away. Who am I that I should go and do this? And then look what he says in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? How can I get them to know it's Jehovah who sent me? This is not what I'm demanding. This is not what I'm commanding. Pharaoh, this is not so much as what I'm asking of you. How can I get them to know that this word does not come from me, but it comes from the God of heaven? How can I get them to see God? It's not a bad question, is it? Then look in chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. What's Moses thinking here? I think I can put it in some pretty good words. He said, what if I do all of this? What if I risk all of this and I'm still not able to convince them that this is the word of God? And then chapter 4, verse 11. Watch what he says. After, actually, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am of slow speech and of slow tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Moses says, in essence, there has to be somebody better than me for this task. Who am I? to do this. It's interesting that Moses had all the same fears that preachers have had throughout the ages. Since the beginning of time, when someone had been commanded to convey the word of God, trust me, these are the fears that they have. Don't have to take my word for it. Paul had these same things. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, who am I? I am the least of all saints is this grace given. I'm the least of all saints. Who am I to do this? The same Paul will say later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, you know, this is not about me. I realize I pledge to preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. How, how can I get people to see that it's not me, Paul, wanting people to do this? This, this, is, this is Christ. This is what he commands. This is what he desires. How can I get people to see that? And then this same one. Acts chapter 26, verse 27, when he is standing there before Agrippa, do you believe, King Agrippa? I know that you believe. Would you act on it? Would you do something about it? I know that you believe. Almost, you persuaded me to become a Christian. What, what more can I do? Paul says, to convince you, Agrippa, if there's anything I can do, just say it. I know that you believe. And every gospel preacher will say that they've had this thought. When they listen to another preacher preach, man, I wish I could preach like him. If I could just preach like that, then I could be a good preacher. This is exactly what Moses is going through in his life. Who am I? We appreciate Moses. Because despite all of his fears, what did he do? He went anyway. You might want to keep that marked, but turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And look at this. We needed to talk about his fears. We needed to talk about his imperfections. Because despite them, look in Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 24. And we'll notice something about what was possible because Moses was willing. Here it is. 
By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to a reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Watch now. Verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. Lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Were as the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Think about this. Because this preacher of old was willing to convey the word of God to another group of people, to Pharaoh and also to the Israelites, I want you to think about what his willingness to be used by God did for this man. He, because he was willing to leave his home, not once Egypt, but twice Midian, look at what he could be a part of. Instituting the Passover, something that has a strong connection even to today to what we do. And partaking of the Lord's Supper. Crossing the Red Sea. The same water that delivered he and the Israelites. Destroyed his enemies. When they got to the other side. At God's command he would instruct the people. How to collect the bread from heaven. How to get water from a rock. Deliver God's law. Written by the hand of God itself. He would get to see the promised land. No he didn't get to enter but he got to see it. And there he died, and he was buried also by the hand of God. But even after that, he wasn't finished. About 2,000 years later, we see him on the earth again. And this time, Luke chapter 9, when Jesus is transfigured, because Moses was willing to do what God told him to do, here he is 2,000 years later, back from the dead, talking to Jesus about his own death that would soon be coming. It amazes me. All that Moses was able to be a part of simply because he was willing to preach and to teach the word of God. Secondly, let's look at the congregation now. Now don't start assuming things. Don't be thinking, I'm saying, boy, he really thinks a lot of preachers. Boy, he's putting them way up. Stick with me. We're going to make a point here. Let's look at the congregation now. I love this, and I know that you do too. Look back at uh, Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. Let's look at this congregation who's willing to be used in the work of God and watch what takes place. Exodus chapter 35, look at verses 4 and 5. It's Moses is preaching, telling the people what God has commanded. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying. That's what a preacher does, doesn't it? Isn't it? He preaches, he teaches what God has told him to say. Take from among you an offering to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. And it goes on with the different types of of things that he's asking the people to give via God's command. Drop down to verse 20, Exodus chapter 35, verse 20. And the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting for all its service and for the holy garments. Don't miss what's taking place here. God is instructing Moses what he needs to do to be able to prepare a place where God would meet with them and be a part of their worship to God. You tell them to do this. You tell them to do this. And they had a willing heart, and that's what they did. Drop down to verse 29. The children of Israel brought of a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing to bring material. You see how many times we're reading that? Whose hearts were willing. Whose hearts were willing to bring material of all kinds for the work which the Lord by the hand of Moses had commanded to be done. These people had a mind to work. Which means they had a willingness to work. They desired to be used in the service of God. And so when the preacher came and said, this is what God commands of you, this is what God desires of you, these people took it to heart and they got right to work because they were willing 
to do it. This wasn't just a speech to them. This wasn't just a talk to them. This wasn't, well, you know, that's a mighty fine lesson that you prepared today. That's a mighty fine lesson. It wasn't, boy, you really stepped on my toes today. It wasn't any of that. When they heard what God wanted them to do from the commands of Moses, the preacher, they got right to do it. You see, if they hadn't been doing it, they started doing it. If it was something that they shouldn't do anymore, they stopped doing it. These people had a mind to work. Now, look at the next chapter, chapter 36, verses 4 through 7. Then all the craftsmen, craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came each from the work he was doing and they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. Did you hear that? These guys are doing too much. <laughs> they brought more than we need. They brought too much stuff. Watch verse 6. So Moses gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary and the people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, Lotso's last words, indeed, too much. Now that's a congregation who was willing to, to be used by God. And then watch the result. You know, we talked about what happened to Moses all because he was willing to be used by God by him putting himself in a position to be used by God. Watch with me now. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 40 and look at the result. Because these people put themselves in a position to be used by God by doing the commands of God, watch what they get to see. And, and, and boy, as we do this, we're not reading Humpty Dumpty or some fairy tale here. There was a day when what we're reading literally, actually happened. It took place here on this earth, and these people who had been so willing to provide and to work, they literally got to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Exodus chapter 40, let's start reading in verse 34. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. So they're all finished. Tabernacle's done. They gave too much. Stop bringing it. We got it done. We fixed it. We've done everything we need to do. Now watch verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. Watch. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Could you imagine? Can you imagine? I don't understand why we need all this gold. I don't understand why we need all this material. I don't understand really what God is wanting to do. But the preacher told us to do it, not because he wants us to do it, but because God told him to tell me to do it, and so I'm going to do it. And so they get this all together, this tabernacle, this temporary meeting place where God would meet with them. They say, well, boy, that is pretty. Boy, those, those craftsmen, they did a fine job. And then when they dedicated, they did something happen that they did not anticipate. Here comes this cloud from heaven. The glory of God, and it fills the entire tabernacle. Verse 35, Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Ah, I love this. Verse 36. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel will go onward in all their journeys. <laughs> so here comes the cloud. It fills the tabernacle. That cloud starts moving. What do you do? You pack up and you start following that cloud. That's awesome. Verse 37, but if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. Well, we're not moving today. Why? God's, God's staying put today. He's there in the cloud. The cloud's here. Hey, we can relax, relax today. Then verse 38, for the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. Is that not awesome? During the day, there's a cloud. The Lord is with us. During the night, 
There's the fire. The Lord is with us. The cloud's moving. <laughs> we better go with the Lord. The fire's moving. Let's follow the Lord. And so because these people were willing to be used by God, they got to experience this on a daily basis. What do they experience? The presence of Jehovah God in their lives. Now maybe you think, I'm putting the congregation on a pedestal too much. Maybe you're thinking I'm putting the preacher and the congregation on the pedestal too much. And if you're thinking that, you're right. Let's go to the third part and our final point. The glory of the Lord appeared because of what they did. And now listen, don't, don't misunderstand me. If Moses hadn't done what he had done, the glory of the Lord couldn't appear in the way that it did, at least because of Moses' actions. He had had to have somebody else. And if the congregation hadn't done what they had done, that is, providing all the materials so much that he had told them, that's enough. Then the glory of the Lord obviously couldn't be above the tabernacle, couldn't fill the tabernacle because it would have never been built. But I want us to notice the reaction of the preacher and the congregation when they saw the results of their work. Let's go to Leviticus now. Leviticus chapter 9, now we're instituting the priesthood. And it's a crying shame that when you go to the book of Leviticus, you only go to chapter 10. Because something beautiful happens in the previous chapter that perhaps we don't appreciate as much as we should. Leviticus chapter 9. Now you watch. The spokesman for God has done his job. The congregation has done their job. Now watch Leviticus chapter 9. Let's start with verse 18. There, there's so much more that we ought to read, but for time's sake, let's just look at verse 18 and following. He also killed the bull and the ram as sacrifices of peace offerings, which were for the people. And Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled all around the altar, and the fat from the bull of the ram, the fatty tail which covers the entrails, and the kidneys and the fatty lobe attached to the liver. And they put the fat on the breast. Then he burned the fat on the altar. But the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved as a wave offering before the Lord as Moses had commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands. You see, they're doing everything right as Moses had commanded. He's doing exactly what he told him to do. Verse 22, then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people. He blessed them and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. Now, here's where it gets really good. Verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Watch. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Verse 24. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They followed the commands of God. They gave generously. They worked hard. Moses was faithful in telling the people exactly what God told him to tell them. What did they do? They put themselves in a position where they would be able to see the glory of God. The glory of God would be able to be seen because these people were willing to work. And what was their reaction when the glory of God was seen? Did they pound on their chest? Look what I did. Do they even say, boy, look what we did. No, when Moses did what he did, when the congregation did what they did, and the glory of the Lord be, fell before them, what did they do? They fell on their faces to the ground. You see, they got it. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the congregation. It's about the glory of God being seen because his people are willing to do his work. That, brethren, is what it's all about.
when each child of God does what God has created him or her to do, it provides the opportunity for the glory of God to be seen and for Jehovah God to be glorified. What will God do with Forest Hill? I'm not asking what he has done because we know he's done great things already. What we're asking on this very big day on which we find ourselves, we ask the question, what will God do with us? The real question is, what will we do? What will we do to give him the opportunity to be glorified in this congregation? And not in just this congregation, but in our towns and in our cities and in our world. Are we going to be mad at the world because they don't know Jesus? Or are we who know Jesus going to introduce them to him? And then this question. What are you doing personally? To allow God's glory to be seen through your actions. Not talking to the person sitting next to you, the person behind you, the person in front of you. I'm talking to you, to me. What am I doing so that God's glory can be seen around me? And that's a sobering question. Because if Moses hadn't done what he did, the glory of God would still be seen, but it would have nothing to do with Moses. If the child congregation didn't do what they did, the glory of God would not be seen through them. And if I'm not doing what God has created me to do as a Christian, then the glory of God will not be seen through the life that I'm living. And friends, that's devastating. You may be discouraged. You may be struggling today. Welcome to the club. So was Moses. We didn't talk about all his weaknesses, all his failures. So was the congregation of Israel. We didn't talk about all their weaknesses, all their failures. But in spite of those weaknesses, look what God did with them. Today is the perfect day for you to allow God to help you fix the struggles that you're going through Start afresh, be remotivated so that God's glory can be seen through me, through you. When we do, God will be glorified. We won't be boastful. When in the weeks and months and years to come, when we see Forest Hill doing amazing things, when we see people obeying the gospel of Christ, when we see people being restored to the gospel of Christ, when we, when we see great things happening, none of us, none of us will be saying, look what I did. Look what we did. We'll be flat on our faces. I can't believe God could use someone like me, someone like you, to allow his glory to be seen.
See, it's not a boastful thing. It's a humbling thing. Are you in a position where God can use you to show his glory? We talked at the beginning about Mozart and his father. You know, that was only successful for one reason. And that reason is because Mozart's father knew how to finish the chord. <laughs> he knew how to finish the scale. He could, he could leave a scale incomplete till the cows come home and it wouldn't have bothered me one bit. And even if it did, I wouldn't have known how to finish it. But his father did. Let's let God finish the scale at the Forest Hill Church of Christ. He knows where to land. You and I don't even know that. He does. He already sees what he's going to do with a willing congregation. Let's just do what we need to do so that God can finish the scale. You need to come home this morning. Maybe you've not been living as you should and the glory of God is not being seen in your life. That's a tragedy, but it's not the worst tragedy. The worst tragedy is doing nothing about it. You can do something about it today. We can pray with you or for you. Or perhaps you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. You can do that today. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, be baptized into him so that your sins can be washed away? You can do that today. You can start the scale and let the father finish it. Won't you come while together we stand and sing the song?